Okay, you guys, so in this last section, we're going to talk about um, the, the ideas of the solar system, basically how um, it was viewed um, originally, and then on into how we understand it to behave now. The first model of the solar system um, was based on the idea that the Earth was at the center and everything else went around the Earth, right? So if you are an ancient person, that's what the way things appear to be. The moon and the sun appear to move through the sky, so they'll say they're going around the Earth. Planets do a similar thing. They appear to move um, night by night, so it looks like you know they're going around the Earth. But as this started to be further understood, they started to realize that the planets did some funny stuff. So the planets move backwards sometimes and then forward sometimes in the sky, and they'll move back and forth if you watch them. And now we understand it now that this has something to do with, with the fact of the Earth's position, right? So as we pass by Venus or as Venus passes by us, or as we pass by Mars or something like that, we're going to see it move in a different way. Um, but they didn't understand that. And so they use what they called epicycles to try to explain the paths of the planets through the sky. And these were basically just like extra little circle loops on an orbit, right? So, so Venus would be on this orbit, but it would get here and then it would go around like that. And that's what they thought it was doing. Um, and that's how you could understand it the way you saw it from Earth. And that's how you could have the Earth being stationary. The problem here is as more and more observations are made, more and more epicycles are needed. And then you have to have more and more and more and more. And there's, they, they just pile on, on top. And it got to the point where it was just uh, completely ridiculous in terms of, of how they tried to um, explain what this would look like. And so this is kind of how you would see those planets move. Right? They would appear to come in this way and then turn and go back the other way before continuing. So in about the 1500s, a man named Copernicus decided that maybe the Earth is not the center of the solar system. Instead, maybe it is the um, sun that's at the center. He proposed what's known as the heliocentric model of the solar system, which we understand that the, the Earth, I mean, the sun is basically at the center of the solar system. As you'll see in just a minute, uh, we can specify this a little bit differently um, in particular. Um, the issue with Copernicus's ideas was the fact that at the time, the church still contained a large amount of power over people. Um, so he was afraid to publish his results. Um, and then when he did, it, you know, it was, it was after his death before people um, started to catch on. The other problem with Copernicus's ideas is that he still maintained some of the epicycles in the planet motion. It was basically just switching the, from the Earth being the center to the Sun, but some of those epicycles got maintained because they didn't quite understand why what they were seeing was happening um, in terms of you know where Mars and things like that are um, to understand why it would look the way it did. Um, you can see here, and I know this is a really complicated picture, um, but you can see here how where our our position in orbit and Mars's position in orbit, the way you would look at it, the way it would appear in the sky, is going to look strange. Right? As you come around, you're moving in front of it, and as you do that, it starts to look like it turns around back the other way, and then continues on. So the first model was the geocentric model, the Earth at the center. We know that that's crazy, um, and the epicycles that piled up over time just made it ridiculous. So Copernicus decides, okay, well maybe it's the sun that's at the center. Um, he still has epicycles. It's still a little bit of a mess. Um, and then along comes a guy named Johannes Kepler. And Kepler established three laws related to planetary motion. Um, and those three laws are still essentially used today. I do believe this, the search for exoplanets at NASA is named after Kepler at this point. I'm not sure about that. Um, however, Kepler had three laws, and so we're just going to talk about those briefly and, and use them to kind of understand how we see the solar system. The first takes away the idea of circular orbits, and Kepler's first law just says that the planets orbit around the sun in an ellipse with the sun at the focus of one of the ellipse, ellipses, or the, with the sun at the focus of the ellipse. Each ellipse will have two foci, 
Okay, they're going to kind of look like this. This is really an exaggerated example. Okay, as you push this this ellipse closer and closer to a circle, the points come closer and closer together until they meet at the middle. When they meet, you no longer have a two foci; you have the center of a circle. So this is they can easily explain why some planets uh, might appear to have circular orbits and why um, you know that was thought initially. Uh, many of the inner planets. Uh, or at least Venus, Mars, and Earth, have nearly circular orbits. They're not circular, but they're close. Mercury's got a pretty non-circular orbit. The further out planets, like Neptune, Pluto, those things are really big ellipses. Um, but they're all elliptical in shape. Circles are still ellipses. They're just special ellipses where both focuses, where both foci are on top of each other. Um, so a circle still counts um, and still works, but we know from observation that many of the orbits of planets are non-circular. Um, they may be close, but they're not quite there. Kepler's second law is a little bit more complicated in that it says that planets will sweep out an equal area in equal amounts of time as they go along their orbit. So, for example, let's just say, and this is again exaggerated, let's just say this is the Earth going around here. Okay, um, the Earth is furthest from the Sun in December. I'm sorry, it's furthest from the Sun in July and closest to the Sun in December. Okay, um, these terms, aphelion and perihelion, perihelion re refers to the closest point, the closest approach, and aphelion re refers to the furthest approach, closest to the Sun, furthest from the Sun. Now, the equal areas thing just means that if this takes one day to make this path here, from this point to this point, then it's going to take one day to make this path here if the area of these two triangles are equal, which, based on this image, they don't look like it, but they are. Um, it's hard to imagine how that's the case when this seems like such a short amount of space and such a big amount of space. But think about the fact that the sun is a, is a pretty big object. When you're further from it, gravity is a little less, and so you move a little slower. When you're closer to it, gravity is a little more, and you move a little faster. So you're actually moving the slowest over here around the sun and the fastest over here. So even though these take, you know, even if this is just a day, right, because you're so much further away here, this triangle that is formed, um, or we'll call it a, a sector, uh, I'm not sure what the exact phrase for that shape would be um, because it's a curved edge. Uh, but this triangle or sector is going to be equal to this triangle or sector. So even though it's going faster, there's just less space over here. Um, so this is Kepler's second law, the idea that, that a planet will sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. Kepler's third law relates the period to the semi-major axis of the ellipse. It's complicated. Um, there's a bunch of extra terms in it. But the idea is that the distance to the planet from the sun, in, in astronomical units, or just the distance from the planet to the sun, is going to be the measure of the semi-major axis of the ellipse. And the period, the time that it takes for it to go around the sun, right, is going to be directly proportional to this, in that the period squared is directly proportional to the distance cubed. And what you see when you do that, when you plot, um, well, in this case, you have a log scale of the time versus the distance. But when you plot this, and what you'll see is you get a line where all the planets fall. And that's how you know that Kepler's third law works. Right? The idea that, that, and this actually provides evidence for all of his laws. Because if they're not ellipses, then this doesn't work. If they're not sweeping out those equal areas, then they're not ellipses. Um, or they're not, you know, in orbit, something else is occurring. So when you combine all three of Kepler's laws, you get a, a vision of, of how we understand how the planets orbit. It's not in circles around the sun, but it's in ellipses around the sun. We know that it travels faster when it's closer to the sun, slower when it's further from the sun. For the Earth, the difference is minimal. For any circular orbit or near circular orbit, the difference is going to be minimal, but it still exists. 
And then the third law just, like I said, just relates period to the distance from the sun. How long does it take? And the longer, the further you are away from the sun, the longer it's going to take to go around. Um, and it just, just happens that the ratio of that is, is um, t squared is proportional to r cubed or the distance cubed.